One, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We only need one more Patreon subscriber to achieve our goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a jackhammer chatterbait or a pack of Senkos, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. You'll get access to our private Facebook group community, members only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. We only need one more, one more person to sign up and we'll have cracked our major milestone. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Today, I have a really special guest. I have Chris Moore. Uh, He is a part of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I'll let you kind of hear from him and how he got started in this. But this really comes in with when I had the David Sikorsky episode on uh, last November. And I had a guy, Alex, you know who you are, who said this is a hot topic that we really need to hit more of. And that's really how I I was able to kind of get in touch with you. So, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Great to be here. So, I mean, again, like before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of everything, how did you get involved in this? What was your history and how did you end up becoming a part of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation? Sure. So I I was uh, fortunate enough to grow up uh, down in Southern Virginia, uh, Virginia Beach specifically. And so, you know, right on the edge of Chesapeake Bay, um, grew up fishing Lynn Haven River, Chesapeake Bay, uh, areas like that. Uh, Also was really fortunate to have family in Northeastern North Carolina. So fished Albemarle Sound, uh, Alligator River, uh, Chowan River, places like that. Uh, So fishing, hunting were, you know, a big part of me growing up and something I carried into my college experience. Um, Went to school at uh, at Randolph-Macon College outside of Ashland and uh, and majored in environmental studies. I kept fishing when I was in college and then actually moved to the DMV um, after that and worked uh, in environmental consulting um, in Northern Virginia for, for various, usually federal clients in that area. Uh, learned to fish some of the small lakes up in Northern Virginia, fish some out of deal uh, when I was up there and, and places like that. And um, I had always wanted to try to get into to fisheries management in some way, shape or form um, when I was consulting. And uh, one of the groups I had worked with some during that time were folks like John Page Williams and Bill Goldsboro from Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And, um, you know, as, as wonderful as the DMV is, um, the pace of life is a little better in Hampton Roads and uh, you're a little closer to the water at times. So uh, the person who was actually running the Virginia Fisheries Program for Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Rob Brumball, um, had moved on to uh, some some great opportunities with the Nature Conservancy. And uh, the Virginia Fisheries Program has always been run out of the CBF Hampton Roads office because of the fact that our fisheries management organization for Virginia is based, uh, used to be based in Newport News. It's based in Hampton now. And so when that position opened up, I said, I'm, I want to give this a try. And, um, you know, it's been a little over 18 years now. And so uh, I get to work uh, on state fisheries issues, blue crabs, oysters, things like that, regional fisheries management issues like uh, striped bass, menhaden, things like that, uh, water quality issues, uh, you, you name it. So it's been a really good experience. And, um, you know, CBF is one of the few nonprofit organizations that actually devotes a lot of resources to working on fisheries management issues. You know, there's a lot of our peer nonprofits that um, work in a lot of different areas, but um, not as many can devote the resources to fisheries management and fish and, and restoration as well that CBF is, a, is able to. And so it's uh, been a really great experience work-wise. We've had David Sikorsky on the show a couple of times talking about the Maryland perspective. Um, is, is, is his organization kind of do the same thing that, that your alls do just for people at home just so they can keep it all straight in their head, but they're just the Maryland side of things? So the, there are a lot of similarities uh, in what the two organizations do. You know, Dave works for uh, Coastal Conservation Association. Um, they're an agency, uh, I'm sorry, they're an association based out of Texas. Uh, they have chapters both on the East Coast and West Coast now. And of course, they were started on the Gulf Coast as well. So there are, are lots of similarities in terms of 
um, what they work on um, from a fisheries policy perspective and things like that. Um, they, they have a little bit more of a recreational angling um, background to them, which makes sense because their their organization is made up of recreational anglers. Um, CBF has a little bit more of a, you know, environmental uh, background to it. Um, we have a little bit more focus on education. Um, CBF is actually uh, one of the largest environmental education organizations, you know, in the U.S. Um, we're really fortunate to have um, a number of different educational vessels where we take students and teachers and, and decision makers out throughout the year. Um, we have a couple island education centers um, out in the Chesapeake Bay where people are able to get a, a real in-depth experience in Chesapeake Bay. And, um, you know, CCA, most of their work tends to be, you know, along the shoreline or in the water. Um, CBF is fortunate enough that we actually spend a tremendous amount of time working with farmers, you know, sometimes two, 300 miles away from the actual shores of Chesapeake Bay, because those water quality improvements we make, you know, even in those areas, those tributaries to Chesapeake Bay, um, make a big difference in, in water quality. So, so there are some similarities, but there's some differences as well. But, uh, you know, like I said, we, we partner with Dave um, very often in, on issues here in the Chesapeake Bay region. You mentioned water quality. Since the, the the Chesapeake and most of our bodies of water, really for that matter, have gone through ups and downs over the last 50 years plus, what have you seen really from you know, 10, 15 years ago up until now? What changes have you seen? Yeah, and, and there's been some ups and downs um, is what it amounts to. And, uh, you know, I, I think going back to when I was growing up and, you know, good example, the Linhaven River <clears throat> that I fished a lot growing up, you know, we are definitely seeing more and better. We're seeing better water clarity than we did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, a number of different reasons for that. Um, but, um, you know, the, the things that we are doing on the ground per se, you know, whether that's um, upgrading our sewage treatment systems, whether it's uh, reducing stormwater flow, whether it's putting what we call best management practices on agricultural fields, those things are helping. Um, the pace is not as fast as we'd like to see it, um, but, you know, th those things are helping. You know, our oyster population is generally on an upswing. Um, you know, they're great filter feeders. They help with water clarity. Um, also, they do help remove some nitrogen and phosphorus as well. Um, you know, we've seen areas where underwater grasses have started to come back at times. Uh, you know, that's a, another big improvement for water quality. Uh, you know, like I said, we've got folks <clears throat> who are working with agriculture operations, getting buffers back on the ground so that there's, you know, a forested buffer, or at least a planted buffer before stream. So those type of things are, are making progress. You know, we are still seeing signs of impaired water quality, though. We're seeing algal blooms at times um, throughout mm -hmm. the year. You know, we're still really maybe about halfway to our goal for underwater grasses in the Chesapeake Bay region. So um, we still have a long way to go, but um, it's good to see that we are making progress in some areas. What is your goal with the underwater or the uh, SAV? So the Chesapeake Bay program has a goal um, of about 200,000 acres. And I'll have to go back and double check that to make sure I get you the exact right one. Rough estimate. But uh, yeah, it's about 200,000 acres of uh, underwater grasses. Yeah. Is there a correlation between the reintroduction or the, the bolstering of local oyster beds and then the uptick in SAV? You know, that's actually one of the things that we're doing a lot of work on right now because uh, there's some new research that's actually showing that, yes, there is a correlation between um, having healthy oyster reefs and then having uh, – SAV, underwater grass, is co-located with those. Uh, you know, the oysters are obviously filtering um, the water. Also, you know, the oyster beds itself may help keep sediment from being resuspended during wind events, storm events, things like that. So um, we've actually got a couple of projects right now that we're working on that would help tease that out a little bit better and see if we really can be successful in restoring those two habitats. You know, it, going back in history, those two habitats were co-located in a lot of cases. You know, you'd have underwater grasses uh, just offshore and say, you know, three, four, five, six feet of water, maybe even 10 feet of water at times. And then in a lot of cases, you, you have oysters closer to the shoreline, especially in the Southern Bay. And that's what we want to see again is, you know, can we co-locate those two really important, really vibrant habitats that we have in Chesapeake Bay? I, that's always fascinating to me from the freshwater perspective, how important SAV is. And I, and I, we can have a healthy conversation about hydrilla and stuff. Um, 
But even talking to Odenkirk and things like that, the hardest thing to do is if you could figure out how to consistently grow it in places it needs to be. And it sounds like you guys have had success with it. Uh, do you feel like you found the secret sauce with that or, or what? <laughs> no, we definitely haven't found the secret sauce. Um, but, you know, we, we have had areas that are, are showing promise. Uh, in fact, I was talking with someone from the James River Association at an event last night, and we talked about how um, they're seeing increases in underwater grasses in the tributaries to the James River, but not in the main stem of the James River. And so we still don't know exactly why that is. Um, you know, another issue is uh, we have two two predominant species of underwater grasses in the saltier areas of Chesapeake Bay. So um, eelgrass and widgeon grass. And um, eelgrass was historically um, the primary species that we had in Chesapeake Bay and, and uh, widgeon grass was a, a little less abundant per se. But what we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years is as our waters have warmed in the Chesapeake Bay region, um, that's really stressing um, eelgrass, especially. Uh, we're kind of on the southern end of its range, and we've had these diebacks of eelgrass when uh, we have those really kind of marine heat wave type events. Um, on the other side, widgeon grass, which um, is again a, another you know very important underwater grass. It grows a little differently, sometimes not as tall. Um, it seems to have a little bit of a boom or bust cycle to it. You know, you might have it for five or six, seven years, you know, be really lush, healthy. And then all of a sudden it goes away for a year, maybe two years. And we don't know exactly why that is. We think, we generally think that widgeon grass is more temperature tolerant, but maybe actually a little less water clarity tolerant. And so when you have like big rain events, um, sometimes we refer to those as freshettes. When we have lots of fresh water coming into the system, it goes away for a year or two. And so that's something that uh, we're continuing to tease out. And this may be another good example of, you know, if you have eelgrass and widgeon grass co-located, you might have some benefits and have healthier stands. We definitely see where that happens. Or, you know, maybe in the future we see oyster reefs and widgeon grass together, and uh, that may make for a, a healthier ecosystem. What temperatures do eelgrass thrive in? What's the range, generally speaking? So generally speaking, when we start to get those water temps up, you know, in the high 70s to the 80s, that's when eelgrass starts to, to really get stressed. Um, you know, if you look up and down the coast, um, eelgrass tends to, to thrive in the more northern areas, mid-Atlantic up to New England and places like that. So, you know, there's a range of temps in the summertime, you know, uh, that that it does very well, you know, high 60s, low 70s, things like that. But the stress point se seems to be somewhere, you know, high 70s, low 80s um, in any given year. With and, and you know, we, we can have in the comments section, you guys can talk about this, whether it's global warming, climbing chase, whatever have you, the water temperature is increasing. Could we see eventually a different SAV start to take hold that's more of a, a southern thriving SAV? There's been some talk about that. There, there are some species that people have, um, <clears throat> wanted to maybe, you know, do some studies with. Um, also, there seems to be some eelgrass down in North Carolina that obviously North Carolina's waters are even warmer than ours. That um, So that strain of eelgrass may be more um, tolerant of these hmm. warmer waters. And so there's some thinking of, well, do we move eelgrass, you know, different strains of eelgrass into the bay and, and try that. So um, there are a number of those things that, you know, folks are trying to tease out. And then also, you know, the fact that um, a lot of this is is temperature, but we, we can't discount the importance of water clarity as well. Um, you know, the, the grasses can't grow if they can't get sunlight. And, you know, for years we've had way too much sediment um, cloud in our waters. We've also had too much uh, nitrogen and phosphorus pollutant. So, you know, when algae, small plants bloom, that clouds the water and doesn't allow for the sunlight to get to the bottom and, and allow those plants to start to grow. And so um, it, we shouldn't be looking at it at our losses of grasses just as a temperature issue. We also have to remember that we continue to need to make improvements in water clarity, basically water quality, so that um, we, we, we can allow that sunlight to reach the bottom and whatever species it is can grow. Um, you, as you can imagine, you know, uh, if you're fighting two stressors, uh, both uh, water temperatures and the lack of sunlight, you're more likely to have negative effects than if you're just fighting one of those stressors. And so that's another thing that we think when it comes to both those species of, <clears throat> of uh, underwater grasses, having to fight both the water temperature issue and also the water clarity issues obviously makes it less likely that you may have success 
when it comes to those species being restored throughout the bay. Is there a single cul culprit that is involved for the increased runoff of phosphorus in the water? No, there's, you know, uh, when it comes to the increases in nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment, those are the three big pollutants when it comes to Chesapeake Bay. Um, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, it's what it amounts to. Um, generally, the, the big sources of pollution that we look at are agricultural runoff. Um, and that's because, you know, still in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, the primary land use is agriculture. Um, we also think about our um, factories and wastewater treatment plants. You know, those are, are, are uh, facilities that have pipes, and we've actually done a, a really good job controlling those over the years. And so um, we continue to see reductions in that sector, but they are a source of pollution. Um, the one that has been very tough to work on and, and try to mitigate, uh, especially over the last 10 to 15 years, is urban and suburban water stormwater runoff is what it amounts to you know what runs off our streets our driveways mm. parking lots um you know we're as you know uh this is fishing the dmv we've grown a little bit in the dmv yeah um, over the years and so that impervious surface um you know it carries you know sediment with it it carries nitrogen and phosphorus with it uh the water runs off faster it doesn't seep into the ground and slowly re re replenish some of those freshwater streams and also you know when it comes to some of our colder water species that that I'm sure you talk about from time to time, um, you know, that water running off those those hard surfaces is warmer. So it increases the temperatures of the of the local waterways as well. I really like I, I really, really want to hit on that part where you said about the urban runoff. I had back uh, in August, I had a farmer that lives right on the Julieta and he talks about how everyone wants to go straight to blaming the farmer first. And he's like, farming is one of the most highly regulated things on the East Coast compared to like out West. And there's a really good tight clamp on that. It could be better, of course, but he talked about like the urban runoff. It's more like the Wild West comparatively to how much scrutiny and regulation is on the farming sector. Uh, how is that one government body that because if you think like even the Richmond area, that place has exploded over right. the past couple of years. Like, do you guys do you guys run that to make sure that that's up to code? Or like who does who does that? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's funny because we get phone calls all the time about uh, it, uh, the fact that, you know, someone is doing something that uh, is in what's called in Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area. And folks think that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation regulates the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area. And that is incorrect. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we don't have any regulatory authority whatsoever. Um, we obviously try to make sure we have good laws and good regulations and funding in place to help make positive change uh, for the Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries that lead in Chesapeake Bay. But we're not a, a regulatory agency agency. Um, so when it comes to those different sources, uh, depending upon where you are, there's different layers of regulation is what it amounts to. Um, whether you're in Maryland or Virginia, you have regulations to help protect shorelines. Like I said, in Virginia, we have the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area. In Maryland, you have the critical area. Um, our our larger cities have what are called MS4 permits, and that stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, and that regulates um, the storm co water collection system and things like that that those, city, uh, those cities operate. Um, the smaller localities and even things like community colleges, um, they have what are called Phase 2 MS4 permits that do some of the same things. Um, so there are some also some local uh, regulations. You know, another thing right now, we're in the middle of our general assembly session, uh, actually in both states, Maryland and Virginia right now, but in Virginia, especially, we're really focused on trying to get more trees uh, in the ground because that's one of the best uh, things we can do, not only from a habitat perspective, but also from a, from a water quality perspective. Um, and then moving to ag, being that we're talking about that as well, you know, I, I would actually say there's not many regulations on ag. A lot of the practices when it comes to ag Ag tend to be voluntary in nature. There are some things like nutrient management plans. Some of the really big farming operations have um, what are called CAFO permits. That's a combined animal feeding operation. Um, but generally, the practices that we see um, on farming fields tend to be voluntary in nature. And there's some really important practices, you know, fencing cattle out of streams, those nutrient management plans I talked about earlier, uh, building buffers um, along streams, doing things like no-till planting. Um, those are all practices that really can improve um, water, water quality and are really important uh, to, you know, continuing efforts to improve water quality, not only at the local level, but also in the, the mainstream of the Chesapeake Bay as well. 
Could you explain for people the acronym AG, and is that just a Virginia state by state, or is that a a regional? Yeah, so AG just stands for agriculture. Uh, it's what it amounts to, and so you know, throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, we have uh, you know a, a really thriving agricultural industry. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, it, it is still the largest land use um, when it comes mm-hmm. to Chesapeake Bay. Um, if you look in Virginia, uh, not far west of the DMV, um, you obviously have a, a lot of uh, animal agriculture. So, you know, you think uh, cattle operations, poultry operations, things like that, uh, kind of east of the DMV, Delmarva, you know, is known as a big poultry producing area as well. Um, both those areas also, um, you know, grow uh, gra- small grains, things like that. Pennsylvania um, also has a fair number of animal agriculture operations. They also have a fair number of what we call row crop operations as well. So, you know, they're growing things like corn, soybeans, uh, things like that, you know, and they, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of areas in the DMV that have grown over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, you know, they have converted agricultural lands in some way, shape or form, um, you know, into other types of housing. And that's why we have some stormwater issues we do now. Interesting. Cause yeah, I was going to say, it's like, so if, if agriculture is the, the, the biggest piece of the puzzle, that's hard for, I think, a lot of people to wrap their heads around if they haven't been out of Richmond and you look at all the construction or Ashburn with that place, right. Western Atlanta has blown up yep. over the past couple of years. Exactly. You know, that is a huge issue. You know, uh, we, we do. We work a lot um, with folks from Farm Bureau during our legislative sessions and things like that. And one of the biggest concerns for those folks is the conversion of agricultural lands, you know, basically working lands to other uses, uh, not only housing and things like that, but, you know, there's big issues or big discussions around data centers in Virginia now. Um, there's big uh, discussions around uh, solar uh, operations now. So, um, l- you know, land use discussions are, are all, all, all always happening. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an issue for us too. Um, even though, like I say, the, the highest amount of pollution comes from ag, um, it's actually the most cost effective to control. And so the practices huh. that we put on the ground uh, for ag um, are much more cost effective than if we're doing a stormwater system somewhere like I live in Virginia Beach, you know, a system that may go in to help retrofit stormwater from a neighborhood because, you know, but good example, my neighborhood was built in the early 70s. You know, at that time when it came to stormwater, all we were doing was trying to get it off our streets off our roadways as fast as we could so we don't have flooding issues and it never really got treated is what it amounts to um fortunately they actually just did a a stormwater upgrade in my neighborhood they put it in our park um it's completely underground it's a pretty neat system but you know that was over a million dollars worth of work um you know that can go a long ways on on a farm operation so um, there's always that balancing piece and that's why um excessively Groups like Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we're constantly advocating for money, not only for those best management practices to go in agriculture operations, but also we're advocating for stronger uh, municipal separate stormwater sewer system permits for urban areas and also for money for those upgrades as well. There's actually in Virginia a uh, fund called the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund, and that helps those localities actually put some of those practices on the ground um, in order to uh, r- reduce the impacts of stormwater and that nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment in our local waterways and then eventually the Chesapeake Bay. Guys, as always, link in the episode description, everything we're talking about here. So if you if you see something, you can you can call somebody. When you mentioned the trees, I think it's interesting. Uh, a week ago, I guess it's that episode will have, will have dropped by the time this one comes out. We talked about uh, Dupont. You know that that comes out to be a hot topic in the Shenandoah Valley, mm-hmm. and how in one of their places, because it's corporate code, they clean cut everything next to the bank to make it look nice and pretty. Pretty, right? So I think it's interesting when you hit the head there. It's like you need forestry you need to have that built-in bulwark against runoff and how important that is yep you know that's that's uh, exactly you know for for years people wanted to to mow right down in the stream banks and things like that or yeah I- exactly when they did big big areas of of uh, what we call managed turf is what it amounts to you know you mow mm-hmm. right down you plant grass um you know it's much better when we have those what we call riparian forested buffers um, whether it's on an agriculture operation or whether it's on a, a mixed-use development or a a, uh, a campus for um, some sort of uh, of industry um, having those buffers and and you know 
they, they really only need about 50 feet to start to make a big difference. But having those habitats in place um, helps obviously treat the runoff that's going to the stream, but also for folks who fish for cold water species, you know, think about things like smallmouth and trout, you know, that's the food factories. Uh, you know, those bugs are falling off those plants, those those trees are providing shade um, for those small streams to keep the water cool. Obviously, they're providing hiding places um, for those for those fish as well. Uh, the leaves that they drop uh, in into those streams obviously start uh, part of uh, the food chain as well, with all the little bugs and things like that that uh, live on those decom- decomposing leaves. So they're really important, and that's part of the mindset that we are trying to change when it comes to, um, you know, our, our repairing areas along our waterways is making sure that we have those buffers in place. Um, when you get to, to some of the, the bigger areas of water, and especially along Chesapeake Bay, one of the big focuses has been what we call living shorelines um, over the last 10, 10 years or so. And so hopefully folks are hearing that term more and more. But, you know, for many years, what people did is they said, okay, I've got an erosion problem. I'm going to put a bulkhead in or I'm just going to rock my shoreline. And in a lot of cases, the the energy that they're trying to stop is actually not that high. And li- what we call living shoreline approaches, you know, using grasses, using plants, using trees, maybe using some some other uh, techniques to, to break up some of that energy as well, um, including things like uh, what we call reef balls, which obviously a lot of folks have fished over reef balls at different times. But using, uh, you know, a mix of those different techniques to um, reduce the wave energy, protect the shoreline, but also protect um, those really important habitat aspects that we see along our shorelines. You know, those are those are areas where a lot of our bait fish uh, grow. It's an area where a lot of our blue crabs um, come and hide when they're small. And, uh, you know, anyone who's fished in the Chesapeake Bay region for, for redfish, speckled trout, things like that, you know, those shoreline habitats are obviously, you know, great fish magnets at times. So um, it's multiple benefits is what it amounts to. Bait fish is a fun topic too, as, as we're getting closer to like the, the, the striper, the, the main, the main entree here today. Um, the Manhaden. Yes. I've had that come up in the comment section once or twice. Once uh, or twice. I'm sure. What are your thoughts on that whole situation? Yeah. So, you know, we, we're right in the middle of the legislative session. Now we obviously, um, had a bill that we hoped was going to help provide uh, the funding necessary to do some science when it comes to Chesapeake Bay. Um, unfortunately that bill got uh, passed, uh, to the next year is what it amounts to. But, you know, a a couple of things when it comes to Menhaden. One, you know, it's really concerning that Virginia is still the one place that we have this industrial fishery um, that takes obviously about 70% of the coastwide catch. And we don't have any science really on the Chesapeake Bay itself. You know, we continue to manage uh, Menhaden on a coastwide basis. And on a coastwide basis, you know, I completely agree with the science that the population looks healthy. But you know, the fishery is, most of the fishery is taking place in actually a pretty small area. You know, the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay and generally, you know, near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay um, out in the ocean. And um, we don't have the science to manage that species um, in that area yet. You know, we, we have a, what we call the Chesapeake Bay cap that was instituted back around 2005. Um, that was and continues to be based on historic landings. It's not based on how the population in Chesapeake Bay is doing. And so we really need good science to, to better manage that species. Um, in addition, you know, we've already talked a little bit today about warming waters. You know, there's a number of species that we think are moving north. You know, striped bass is, is one of them, um, obviously. Summer flounder is another one that we know is moving north. Probably black sea bass as well. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, you know, we probably have more shrimp uh, in 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 any given year than we than we have in in, in years and years that's probably a, a a species that's moving north speckled trout which you know used to leave here every winter um people are catching them all year round now here in the lower bay and so you know we're, we're seeing shifts uh, a good example um, our education vessel that fish that that works down here in the lower bay they called a barracuda <laughs> two two sure. falls ago in the wow. lower bay uh, i catch grouper uh, almost every year now uh small ones but uh juvenile ones but i catch them in the Linhaven river um almost every year so Damn. we're seeing those changes wow. and so you know i i think that's another thing that really worries me when it comes to menhaden is are we seeing <clears throat> more of those fish 
you know, kind of moving north and, um, or, you know, would less of them come into Chesapeake Bay? And then you layer on the fact that the fishery for Menhaden is obviously huge. You know, it's, it's like I say, industrial scale fishery, and it can stay relatively efficient even as the number of fish go down because they have the spotter planes to help spot the schools of fish. You know, they go out, um, you know, the day before they even start fishing to try to spot the schools where they are things like that so um there, there's obviously lots of concerns there and it, it is really unfortunate um a lot of work had been done um during 2023 to try to pull some of the science together and it's really uh, unfortunate that we actually uh, may have to wait another year for that here in virginia so uh, you know we want to continue to do things to to, to obviously reduce the impact of the fishery when we can. Obviously, we want to reduce user conflicts uh, between the fishery, but um, you know, I, I think big concerns still remain when it comes to that fishery in Chesapeake Bay. What's more of a canary in the coal mine? Is it the the tons of data on the just deteriorating striped bass population, or is it seeing the uptick in shrimp? That are actually coming into the bay. So I, I tell you, um, and we can maybe go to the slides here for a second. Yep. Um, I, one of the things that um, really concerns me. Um, let's see if we can get to this. It slides up. Yeah, there we go. This is actually um, some data that was presented at at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission um, back in 2023, and. Um, this is actually from what you what is still called the North Carolina Cooperative Tagging Program, and so this is where they tag um, big fish, like you see in the picture there. I think we'd all love to catch a fish like that uh, here in Chesapeake Bay region, but they they tag these um, big coastal migratory spawning fish out in the ocean each year. And uh, if you look down at the bottom uh, of the slide to the right here, you can see the the kind of green dots. This was when this um, tagging program actually used to um, use trawlers to do this study. They would, you know, pull a big trawl, bring it in, tag the fish, and release them. And, you know, we get tag releases for years after that. But um, as you can see, as um, the green kind of changes to yellow, the yellow kind of changes to red, uh, basically the redder the, the, the dot is, the more recent that actually uh, data came from. And that's the year they found those fish off the coast during the winter time. Um, back in about 2011, 2012, they actually changed this over to basically using a, a sport fish vessel. It's actually a Chesapeake Bay. It's Ryan Rogers, uh, Midnight Sun um, out of Smith hmm. Point. He actually uh, runs the program. Um, that's where that, that picture is actually taken of the big fish. But um, you can see, you know, uh, we moved up to the mouth of Chesapeake Bay in terms of catching those fish. And then if you go to the very top of that in 2023, um, they actually caught those fish off the mouth of Delaware Bay on the north side of the mouth of Delaware Bay. So, you know, this is one of the things that, that really concerns me in terms of, of say striped bass population. And, you know, is this all climate change driven? Hard to tell, you know, is it the fact that, you know, maybe the Menhaden aren't moving as far south as they used to, you know, or, or other bait they may be, may be eating uh, during the winter is not moving far south as well. But, you know, this is about 200 miles or so difference in where these fish used to overwinter. You know, I've got good friends who used to catch them down off Moorhead City um, in the wintertime uh, in the mid 90s. And, you know, there's basically zero winter fishery in North Carolina anymore. Um, you know, our fishery here where I'm based in Virginia Beach is just a shell of what it used to be. And so, you know, that that's one of the things that really concerns me um, and maybe is maybe the biggest canary in the coal mine uh, when it comes to this issue. Here's a dumb question that I've asked to to Dave, and I asked to also uh, Gary Martin of the Potomac Association. So, what can be done about it? Yeah, so you know, I, I think a, a, a couple things. One, when it comes to this, one is we need to have as healthy a population of striped bass as we can. Um, you know, we know that Chesapeake Bay historically has provided about 70% of the coastwide population of striped bass. Um, we need to make sure we have as many breeding fish as possible when it comes to, um, to that population. So when we have years that we have, you know, good reproduction in Chesapeake Bay, we have lots of those big fish to actually successfully spawn. So, uh, you know, that's obviously one thing. Uh, you know, another thing, obviously, is we need to continue to improve habitat in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, you know, things that we talked about earlier, like those buffers, um, 
that help cool the water, um, ensuring that we don't have uh, harmful algal blooms happening um, is, is another piece. Um, making sure that, you know, when those fish are there, that we have the, the best environment for them. Uh, you know, as the fish grow, then, um, you know, having a healthy population of menhaden obviously is, is another important piece of this. Um, but uh, it's, it's we, we need to do a number of different things in order to make sure the, the population is as healthy as it can be. And that when we do have, um, you know, the right conditions for striped bass to spawn, um, they can do that successfully is what it amounts to. I have so many thoughts on that, but is there another <laughs> slide you want to get to too? I just want to make sure we we hit all the slides first before I uh, sure. No, there's there's just one other one I want to think about or talk about a little bit when it comes to striped bass, or, or maybe I'll, I'll talk about two. Um, this one is really specific to striped bass, and so being that we're on striped bass right now, I'll talk a little bit about this one. Um, this is you know what we're seeing in Chesapeake Bay, and you know I've talked about this a little bit already today. Um, the, what we call habitat squeeze, you know in uh, the population. Um, waters are warming, as we talked about already. You know, we're kind of on the southern end of the striped bass range. So um, they want to be kind of in those cooler, deeper waters during the summertime, you know, just kind of hanging out those warm months. And um, when we have areas of low dissolved oxygen, um, unfortunately, they can't get in those deep, cool waters. And so that's why our efforts to improve water quality are so important. You know, um, when we when we don't have sufficient you know cool deep water habitat you push them into those warmer waters up at the top near the surface that um, you know they really don't want to be in and it stresses them out and you know when fish are stressed they you can succumb to disease things like that stress you, uh, you name it and so that's what's really important and that's a, another reason why um, you know our organization has actually been really supportive of making sure we have a, a, clo a longer closure period uh, for striped bass in the summertime um, you know just just trying to leave these fish alone as much as possible especially when water temps are um, high and air temps are high as well so um, you know I, this is something that anglers you know when we have those 90 degree days and the water temps are really um, really up there, you know, think about fishing for something else um, during that time period. So um, just one other slide I'll kind of point people to um, on this is this is actually we've already talked a little bit about Menhaden and uh, obviously we've talked about striped bass, but this was a, uh, a slide that is about 10 or 15 years old at this point. But, um, you know, one of the things that that I always talk to people about when it comes to any fish, shellfish in Chesapeake Bay, I think a lot of people <clears throat> Um, sometimes revert to what I call the silver bullet approach to fisheries management. And you hear it and they say, you know, if we just did this, mm -hmm. our fishery would be fine. And, you know, I've heard it about blue crabs. We've heard it about striped bass. Uh, I'm sure there's freshwater species. I don't follow quite as many freshwater species as I do saltwater species, but I'm sure you've hear some of that too um, with some of the freshwater species. But, you know, this shows you kind of the interconnectedness of, of a different species that we have in Chesapeake Bay. And again, this one happens to be striped bass in Menhaden. But we talked about the water quality um, piece here. You know, the fact that we want to reduce those nutrient inputs um, into um, our, our Chesapeake Bay tributaries and the Chesapeake Bay itself, uh, because those nutrient inputs have, have really changed the algal community um, in Chesapeake Bay at times. And that actually may be one of the reasons why we don't see as many menhaden on the western shore now. We see more of them on the eastern shore is, you know, we tend to have more runoff uh, from the rivers uh, on the western shore. Um, mm. We talked a little bit about the dissolved oxygen. You know, um, we had really good news this year uh, when it came to dissolved oxygen, but also we had, you know, one of the lowest flows um, this spring and our, our spring flows, uh, you know, water running from our, from our rivers, especially the Susquehanna, because it provides over 50% of the fresh water to the bay. That's a real big driver about how many nutrients are in the bay each year. And so, um, you know, how that affects water quality throughout the summer is obviously really important. Um, I'll kind of jump up to the center there. You know, we've talked about this, you know, weather conditions, climate conditions in any given year. Is it a really hot year? Is it a really sunny year? Is it a windy year? So the bay continues to kind of turn over, things like that. But those, you know, those changes we're seeing in climate are definitely making a, a difference. And then obviously we have the fishery part of this. You know, we can 
generally control our fisheries. You know, we're, I know we're going to probably talk a little bit later about some changes that have happened for striped bass. We've been talking about changes possibly for the Menhaden fishery. Um, that's one of the things we definitely can affect and we should continue to look at, um, you know, changes that we need to make to, to make our species healthy. And then, you know, kind of in the middle there are all those different interactions between um, bait fish, you know, predator fish and things like that. And so that's, again, something we need to be thinking of. You know, another topic that's been really big here in the Chesapeake Bay region for the last, you know, five to 10 years is blue catfish. Um, yeah. How many how many species are, are being eaten by blue catfish? And uh, again, I was, I've talked a, a fair amount about fisheries this week, fortunately. Talked to some folks last night about, you know, the impacts of snakeheads um, on some of our species. But, um, you know, blue catfish, you know, rightfully so, has really become an important topic um, here in the Chesapeake Bay region because we are really looking to try to develop some solutions to reduce that population because, you know, it seems like they can eat just about anything they can get their mouths on. You know, we've even seen them uh, with duck bills in their mouths and things like that. And, you know, their habitat <clears throat> really overlaps a lot more than people realized when it comes to some of these species like, you know, young of the year striped bass, river herring, shad, things like that um, when they're in those river systems. You know, a, a, another big one that we probably won't talk a whole lot about, but is blue crabs. Uh, there was a mm -hmm. study from just um, about a year or so ago now that looked at blue catfish interactions with um, blue crabs. And uh, the estimate was that blue catfish were eating, you know, about 1.3 million uh, blue crabs each year, just in a fairly small section of the Lower James River. Um, you know, we, we know that a lot of, of our fish species that we like to catch uh, love to eat blue crabs, red drum, croaker, uh, you know, cobia sometimes are called crab eaters in different uh, areas of the, of the country. So, you know, blue crabs are uh, an important forage for a lot of species as well. Blue catfish are not just, um, they're, they're not just a special situation here in this estuary, but if you look at like the Mississippi Delta, there's a couple places down south where there are blue catfish. Why do you not see this assault on the local ecosystem in those other places compared to here? Is it because we're still at the beginning of them being involved when you think of, you know, the whole idea of them introduced, you know, 10 to 20 years is finite comparatively. Right. You, you know, the, the big issue is it, it, they're native to those other water bodies, Mississippi uh, Delta area, things like that. They they really they aren't native Chesapeake Bay region. We obviously had some native catfish species, um, things like uh, a white catfish, catfish for example. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but channel catfish are actually another introduced species here in the Chesapeake Bay region. But blue catfish, they grow so big, um, is what it amounts to, and they are a, a, a a predator that can really change what they eat over their lifetime. Um, when the fish are young, um, we think they tend to eat mostly things like uh, you know, mussels, clams, things like that, maybe even detritus in a lot of cases. But then uh, as the fish get a little bit bigger, uh, you know, uh, on the area of two to three pounds, maybe four pounds, they really start to shift to a more fish-based diet. And, um, you know, that obviously has, has big implications for our rivers uh, where those fish are located because you, you think about all the different fish species in those, I'll call them generally like tidal fresh areas where they're, where they're mostly found, but obviously they're sneaking down into some more brackish water areas as well. But, you know, they're, they're foraging on a lot of species that, you know, people like to go, go catch, you know, white perch, uh, ring perch is another one. Uh, we talked about some of the elosins like American shad, things like that. Um, you know, if they can get it in their mouth, they're going to eat it. And, uh, we are still fairly early uh, in some ways in, in their introduction. I mean, it has been about 40 years or so now. But, you know, in, in some river systems, we may have seen the peak um, blue catfish biomass. But, you know, there are some estimates that in excessive systems like the James and the Rappahannock, around 70 percent of the biomass may be blue catfish. And, you know, that just shows you that's kind of a system out of balance. We need a, a much more diverse ecosystem to uh, provide the angling opportunities that we want to see, but also to have a, a healthy functioning ecosystem as well. When I was looking at research papers for like the snakehead introduction and, and really looking at the Potomac River first before the Rappahannock, since it was introduced really at the Potomac first, you saw the jump in population before eventually it plateaued and then it's starting to try to find some kind of homeostasis. Now that is a different sample size, different species. In theory, 
in the next 50 years, is that what we should see is we're seeing this boom in their population. Eventually it would plateau and then we'll find out whatever that new homeostasis will be. You know, if we don't manage the population in some way, then yes, we would see that. Um, but right now, um, you know, there are a lot of different efforts focused on trying to reduce the number of, of blue catfish um, out in the ecosystem and make that plateau a lot smaller in terms of the biomass in our river systems. You know, here in Virginia, um, we actually have an electrofishing fishery for them. Um, you can, uh, you know, hopefully uh, n use other fishing gears as well to, to knock those fish back. Um, we've had uh, efforts in both Maryland and Virginia the last couple of years to try to increase processing capacity on those fish so we could get more of those fish in the market. You know, it, it admittedly is a fairly low value fish. Um, so folks who harvest them need to sell a fair amount of them to, to make, um, you know, to make a profit on those. Um, catfish are, are admittedly a fairly hard fish to process compared to some other species. You, you generally have to hand cut them. Um, so that's more labor. Um, also, unfortunately, one of the things that really hurt us in getting the processing capabilities off the ground here in the Chesapeake Bay region is there was some legislation that was actually part of the farm bill, believe it or not, a, a couple uh, farm bills ago that basically banned the import um, of fish, of, of catfish to protect the, the that Gulf market and required inspections for processing catfish. And we don't have an inspection set up for any of our other seafood processing capability or, or operations. And so this really disrupted the amount of processing capabilities that we have in the region. And so we're trying to find some workarounds for that as well to make sure that, again, we try to reduce the um, the things that processors need to do um, and, and make sure we can get as many of these fish to the market as uh, successfully and as efficiently as possible. So here's a fun question I asked Joe Love of, of the Maryland uh, DWR, David Sikorsky, and then uh, Martin Gary. And it's okay if you don't have an answer because they didn't either. When people <laughs> say like, we removed uh, a ton of blue catfish, my thing is like, great, but what is the percentage we have to hit to see an impact? Do we right. have a ballpark of what that would be? Do you have any thoughts on that to where it's like, this is what we need to be taking out per month or per year to see an impact? Yeah, we, we really don't yet. Um, it's unfortunate. It's what it amounts to. Um, part of the reason for that is <clears throat> blue catfish have basically been found to be more adaptive to the salt, saltier water areas than we thought. Yeah. Um, in addition, sometimes when we have those freshets I talked about earlier, lots of, of fresh water, they can go down river, jump river systems, things like that. So, um, generally when it comes to, to blue catfish and, and most freshwater species, you know, when you do scientific research on freshwater species, uh, actually electroshocking, you know, is one of the techniques they use pretty often to do that. Um, you can't shock in those saltier water areas. And so you've got to use different scientific collection methods to do that. You know, maybe it's trawls, maybe it's nets, things like that. But we haven't put all those pieces together yet to say, okay, here's the population now here's what we need to get it down to in order to to have a, a more balanced ecosystem is what it amounts to and you know that's something that folks will continue to to think about and work on but um i would say at this point it's it's full speed ahead to try to reduce the population in any way shape or form whether it's through a commercial fishery recreational fisheries you know things like that um we, we know that uh there's too many of them out there and things that we can reduce to, to things that we can do to reduce that population is going to be helpful so getting into the regulation standpoint, what do we have coming down the pike uh, for the striped bass populations? And, and even like we go to the blue cat, or blue cats, blue crabs as well. Sure. So um, when it comes to uh, striped bass, uh, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission met back in uh, uh, late January, early February, and actually set up uh, a, a new set of regulations coastwide um, for, for striped bass. And again, this is... Uh, all trying to help us restore the striped bass population by, by 2029 is what it amounts to. And uh, as I'm sure you're aware, and some of the folks who actually listen to the podcast are aware, we, um, we actually have gone through a couple of different um, regulation changes over the last couple of years to try to increase the population. And it's, it's beginning to slowly do that. Um, but there are still some obviously concerns about reproduction, um, as folks who follow this, the species kind of know, and as, as, as we feel at Chesapeake Bay Foundation, you know, we, we, 
this past year, we really had a recruitment failure when it comes to striped bass. And we've had low recruitment uh, in Maryland the last couple of years. We're about the last five now. Virginia, we were average up until this year. And um, one of the things that, you know, we'd been hearing about was, you know, some people were like, well, the fish are just moving north and um, places like the Hudson River. They're going to make up for that spawning that we're not having in Chesapeake Bay anymore. And actually, about a month or so ago, we got data from the Hudson, and that wasn't great data either. Um, is what it amounts to. So, um, you know, there there wasn't good spawning success all all along the coast, uh, unfortunately. But when it comes to to new regulations for this year, um, one one of the big things that uh, will stay in place is that uh, twenty eight to thirty one inch slot limit um, for the coastal fishery. So those folks who fish um, out in the ocean for striped bass, um, that fairly narrow slot is going to re remain in place um, for for those folks. In addition, um, Virginia a number of years ago had actually um, gotten rid of its trophy fishery, but you've obviously seen Maryland come out as well, and we won't have a trophy fishery in the spring uh, in, in, in Maryland now uh, moving forward as well. And so um, you're going to see some obviously changes there. Um, another thing you'll see is <clears throat> they adopted a 19 inch to 24 inch slot limit um, in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, the Chesapeake Bay is, has always been managed a little bit differently uh, than some of the areas along the coast. And we've tended to have the smaller uh, slot limit for fish because we are a producer area and our fish tend to be a little bit smaller. Um, one of the things that a lot of people had uh, kind of voiced a concern or a want to do, especially the fisheries managers in this region, is try to get our regulations in the Chesapeake Bay region um, as similar as possible. You know, previously we had different slot limits for fish. We had different size limits for fish. We had different seasons, things like that. But um, one of the efforts that the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission made was to try to get our size limits, our slot limits, um, as, as close as possible. So moving forward um, for this upcoming year, at least, we're going to see the same 19 inch to 24 inch slot limit throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, another change, especially for folks uh, who maybe have fished in Maryland, this won't be a change so much in for Virginia, but um, Maryland had what was called a mode split in their fishery. And so folks who were fishing on charter boats um, were allowed to, to keep two fish, whereas folks um, who uh, were fishing from the shore for private boats, they only were allowed a, a one fish bag limit. Um, and so that's another change, again, to try to make uh, the fisheries more congruent um, in the Chesapeake Bay region. So there's a, a one fish bag limit um, for all the different uh, fishery participants. Um, seasons have generally stayed the same, although you've seen some some um, new regulations come out of Maryland for an additional week off, I believe, during the summertime. Also, you've seen some, some no-take areas up on the Susquehanna Flats. And then uh, last, <clears throat> one of the big things is the commercial quota here um, throughout actually Chesapeake Bay region and actually uh, in the ocean as well was cut by 7%. Um, mm. You know, a lot of people don't realize that we actually have a really big difference in our commercial fishery here in Chesapeake Bay versus along the Atlantic coast. If you go and look uh, striped bass coastwide, um, 90% of the harvest actually comes from recreational anglers. Um, here in the Chesapeake Bay region, we actually are much closer to 50-50 um, when it comes to the, Interesting. Uh, yeah, the take. And so um, that is a much bigger piece here in the Chesapeake Bay region because our fishery tends to be closer to a 50-50 split. A lot, a lot to unpack there. A lot, to, a lot unpack. to unpack. There That's that. right. That's right. It is. And, you know, it's, um, it, you know, change uh, is, is always um, a little tough, but I, I do think there were some some big benefits here in terms of trying to get the size limits the same, especially in the Chesapeake Bay region. Because as you know, you know, especially if you're in the DMV, you could go fish in Deal one weekend and then maybe come down and fish here at the Chesapeake Bay Ridge Tunnel the next weekend. Um, and that's this way, um, you're you're fishing on the same the the same size limits no matter where you are. So I think that is a good thing. Um, and again, Maryland's is going out on its own a little bit and. Uh, uh, doing some additional conservation measures uh, to try to protect more of that breeding stock as well. Like I say, Virginia got rid of its um, uh, com uh, trophy fishery a couple years ago. We we'll see that's obviously going to happen in Maryland as well now. Um, you know, again, with 
the water quality issues, with the climate change issues, um, you know, making sure we have as many of those large breeding fish to try to take advantage of the years where we have uh, good conditions for, for reproduction is going to be really, really important. With the waters warming uh, throughout not just the Chesapeake, but the Atlantic, could we see Nova Scotia and the Gulf of St. Lawrence become premier striper destinations in the next 10 to 20 years? <laughs> 20 years. You know, um, I, I, I don't want to hazard a guess on that <laughs> yet. Um, we'll see. You know, I, I, and I've told this to a few groups I've talked to recently. I, one of the things that does worry me is that a, as good a science as we have for a lot of these species that we manage, like striped bass and things like that, I'm still not sure we're catching we're, we're really understanding the impacts of climate change on those species. And so I, I think that is a little bit of an open-ended question. Um, you know, a good example, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, I think manages 26 different species now. Um, you know, they obviously get a fair amount of funding, um, you know, the states support them and things like that, but that is a tremendous um, workload um, for that organization to try to do. You know, we generally do um, stock assessment updates every three years, and then we do what we call benchmark assessments every six years. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's actually, you know, keeping up with some of the changes that we're seeing out in the ecosystem, especially when it comes to climate change and something we may need to, to take into account. Um, with with some of these different species so not, not to end on a dour note what's interesting is with the the exodus of the striped bass you're also seeing honestly a massive uptick in other inshore species speckled trout is booming puppy mm -hmm. red drums are blooming booming you know shrimp are back people are saying they're seeing more and more tarpon now allegedly i don't have documented proof of that but it's out there especially on the eastern shore yeah people people a don't barracuda. talk about tarpon very <laughs> very often no if you, if you fish for those that's uh you're kind of type type lip which is funny because that's kind of how when i was growing up that was how the speckled trout fishery was you know that was yes. there were the, the old saying was uh you know a good speckled trout fisherman would rather have a fish die in the water than bring it on the boat and let other people see that they were actually yep. catching a speckled trout uh so yeah you remember that as well you know now i mean speckled trout i feel like sometimes um you know you could walk almost boat to boat you know everybody's fishing for speckled trout um is what it amounts to and it's crazy because like there's still opportunities to fish so when we when i've had so many guests on talking about the the issues with striped bass and people are like well the the, the, the chesapeake's dead it's going through an evolution process for better or worse. And there's going to be tons of fishing opportunities. I think this is why you're seeing an uptick in kayak clubs, honestly, mm -hmm. is there's so many inshore species now that you can catch that the Carolinas have been spoiled with forever. Right. Yeah, it, it's going to be different. Um, that's what I tell people. We don't know exactly what the mix may be um, when it comes to our different species. And, and it really is uh, unfortunate where striped bass are now. You know, th there's there's such part of the cultural fabric here in the Chesapeake yes. Bay region, you know, um, it, you know, it, and, and I grew up fishing in Virginia. You know, it was our winter species. You know, there everything else was gone. Um, you know, striped bass, you know, we would sometimes bust ice or, you know, I remember a couple of years taking uh you know, having to shovel snow out of the boat. Uh, one of the best trips I ever had uh, was actually in January where uh, I, you know, duck hunted in the morning, took the duck blind off the boat and then went and caught, you know, striped bass all afternoon out of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Um, it, it was really a great angling opportunity for us. And it was a species you really could count on throughout the year. Uh, well, especially in the fall, but you could count on those opportunities is what it amounts to. And, um, with with climate change, we're still not sure what all the winners and losers are going to be. And so I think when it comes to striped bass, that's one of the reasons we need to be so focused on trying to restore the species is, you know, if we can get good reproduction and maybe get, the, you know, a good pipeline going, you know, we, we still may be able to, to have a much more robust fishery in the future. You know, if you go back and look at the history of striped bass, it's not that they have great reproduction every single year. You know, it's probably every yeah. three, four, or maybe five years where they have a very big what we call year class and then that kind of sustains the population um, throughout the years and you know right now the unfortunate part is 2015 was the last you know really good year class 2017 was kind of decent um, we haven't seen a whole lot since then and so 
um, you know, we really need to, to have, you know, a, a couple of, of big year classes, hopefully in the, in the next couple of years, because, you know, as a lot of people have talked to, and I even talked to some, some outdoor riders um, last year when we started implementing some of these changes and they were like, you know, this is just a Chesapeake Bay problem. This is not, um, you know, a, a, a New Jersey, New York problem. We're having the best fishing we've had in years. And that may be true, but remember they're fishing on fish that are 10, 12, 15 years old, maybe 20 years old. The, the pipeline, behind it's just not there right now and you know i think a lot of people like i said thought the fish were just going to move to the north but you know the, the the data we're seeing out of the hudson at least this year is not spilling that out so that's something we we need to think about but you know going back to i mean yes thinking about changing our our angling opportunities a little bit um because different species are here now you know I, we've always had spanish mackerel um in the area but I, I hear about more reports of them being farther and farther north during the summertime um, i hear about more people catching cobia up around the state line than i used to um again growing up here you know we, we stopped fishing cobia were big yeah, yeah we stopped fishing um for speckled trout and redfish in the summer you know i, I remember surf fishing a couple of years and being amazed that we actually caught a couple of redfish mixed in from time to time <clears throat> with striped bass, you know, around July, uh, um, January one, uh, in the winter time. Um, I like I say now, I mean, if you go out and the weather's decent in January, February, people are fishing for redfish here in the lower Bay. So there, there are going to be some changes. Uh, but I, I, I do, you know, want to make sure people don't get away from the fact that we should be doing everything we can, both from an environmental standpoint, you know, improving water quality, but also from a fisheries management standpoint, because of that importance of species like striped bass to the, to our fishery opportunities, to our, to the fabric of the region. Um, it is such an important species. And, um, you know, we, we need to be thinking about all those different ways that we can help improve the population, you know, making sure they have enough forage out there. Obviously, we talked a little bit about Menhaden um, earlier. You know, there's also been studies about things like spot. Um, have those numbers been down? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Chris, I mean, I really appreciate all the time that 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 you gave me today. Um, is there anything if people want to comment, want to get involved, where can they go? You know, th there's lots of opportunities. And I think that's you bring up a really good point. Um, the the ability to comment and be involved in uh, our fisheries discussions is a, a, an opportunity that people really need to take advantage of because uh, people want to hear their voices. You know, it's it's funny. I, I attend some of the virtual meetings and uh, for for ASMFC and you know there may only be fifteen or twenty people um, on there. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of legislative work as well. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of anglers at times. You know talking to folks about say funding for for menhaden studies things like that um <clears throat> make sure you stay up with the public hearings that the atlantic states marine fisheries commission has they meet three times a year in um in arlington so it's really easy for folks in the dmv to to participate uh in those meetings uh right right down there in uh in crystal city um and then they meet one time a year um in one of the member states uh, it's going to be maryland this year so people could participate there um in Virginia, we have the Virginia Mar Marine Resources Commission. In Maryland, uh, you have Maryland DNR. Um, take advantage of those opportunities to participate in the fisheries management process. You know, it's you're not always going to get everything you want, um, but you know you're going to interact with some really smart people. Uh, it, it's it's amazing some of the folks you mentioned, folks like Marty Gary. Marty, you know, spent time with Maryland DNR. Then he was at the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Um, you know, we've got uh, you know Maryland. Um, uh, Center for Environmental Science. I mean, we've got really, really smart people, you know, Dave Secor working on these issues and taking advantage of that knowledge, um, hearing what those folks have to see uh, or, or say uh, can really be helpful to understanding, you know, this very complex ecosystem that uh, we're all trying to in improve from a water quality and habitat perspective, but also making sure that, you know, we can have these type of angling opportunities for future generations. I mean, as we talked about earlier, it's, it's the reason I have the job I do now is because uh, I love going out and, and fishing for all sorts different species here in the region growing up. Chris, thanks again so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Please get involved. It really will help out so they can hear the people. And, and honestly, a lot of times the people that are on the water, I hear this from my river keepers all the time from guys and stuff. You're the first ones to see something if it happens. Take a picture, take a video, get involved. Like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens.
Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.